Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's an honor to be, to be the first guy over here on the stage tonight and to, to welcome you for, for several days of entertainment and hopefully a lot of knowledge to be shared over here. My name is Jeko Stefanov. I'm a lead producer in Gameloft. I'll be talking today with Vasil Gurgiev about the state of the industry and why having your audience and market in mind matters. Vasil Gurgiev, he's a user acquisition lead in Gameloft Sofia. In case you're wondering what user acquisition lead means, that's a person that can spend a whole lot of money really fast. <laughs> joking, sorry. I had to do it. So uh, I'd like to start with a quote from the creator of Minecraft. When I was young, we didn't have indie games. We had garage developers or similar teams who were just small teams making games out of passion. So Gosho, do you know what else he didn't have when he was young? He didn't have an industry that's the most, that created the most profitable entertainment product of all time, which is right now GTA V. He didn't have an industry which, which can say that its top 10 games for 2018 are 25% more successful in terms of revenue than the top 10 uh, movies. And he didn't have an industry where game revenues grew and are over $130 billion for 2018. And he couldn't believe, because he, he really hates mobile and microtransactions, that the industry is finally going to switch and over 50% of the revenues is going to be in mobile. Of course, driven by the, grew, the growth of Southeast Asia in the recent years. And the forecasts are nothing but spectacular, with an estimated 100 billion only in mobile by 2021. So, why did that happen? Yeah. Sorry, I already showed you the answer. It happened because of the online distribution channels that are everywhere right now. And because internet really enabled our industry to, to grow, really enabled us to, to find an easy way towards our audiences. There's a very low barrier of entry, literally anyone that can follow the rules of the App Store, for example, can can get an app in submission and can get his app on the store and into the hands of millions of users. The stores promote our titles to wide audiences, to audiences that never believed five years ago they would be gamers. The stores also offer a very convenient um, access to payment methods, literally at your fingertips now with finger recognition, unlocking your phones. But there's also one more thing. All these games, they make us really hard to find. There's literally thousands of games being developed and released every day. So I'd like to, to focus on the different innovations, disruptive innovations, part of them, that really allowed us to, to get where we are. Those are mine, my list of those. So if you, if you don't agree with me, I'd be happy to discuss it in the Q&A. So Steam, first of all, in 2003, when, when the PC market was not really into, into a good spot, Steam really rev revolutionized the uh, the, the way games are distributed, and right now the market is in the process of shifting from, a, from, from the normal model, the, the physical model, to the digital model. Facebook in 2004, Facebook laid the foundations for casual gaming, 
that would blow up in 2007 with the release of the iPhone. Later on, in my opinion, League of Legends, that was the, the first title that showed that a fair microtransaction free-to-play model could exist on the market. Then Minecraft in 2011, that really uh, opened up the space. It showed a lot of parents that games can be very educative, that games are not violence, that games shouldn't be, shouldn't be perceived as something bad. Then in 2012, Candy Crush and Clash of Clans. I'm sure most of you have seen those games if you live in, on that planet. They really, they really showed us that, that microtransactions are here to stay, that free-to-play model is here to stay, that the industry is going in that direction, like it or not. And last year, Fortnite, the game that topped the charts this year with over 2.4 billion revenue in just one year and a lot of years of, uh, of, of Twitch streaming and a lot of, a lot of achievements and awards right now. So how do we thrive in, in that market that's so crowded that everyone is trying to disrupt the market, everyone is trying to, to get on top? How do, we, how do we really thrive? And I think that we should question all our decisions every day that we, that we work on our creations, and we should try really to, uh, to go ahead and do, do our market research. What do we want to create? So how are, we, uh, how are we going to prototype it? Are we, are we going to show it to our friends? Are they going to like it? If they, if they like it, what kind of resources are we going to need to finish that project? Who would play the game? Maybe like look at look at different um, player profiles. Try to try to build a, an ideal persona for your game. What does he like? What does he play? What really motivates him in games? Is it achievement? Is it social? Is it is it just battling other players for the rule to be the best? Try to try to build this persona. Try to cater to him with with gameplay that is really allowing him to to live up his fantasy, try to, to, really be, to really provide to him the content that he wants to get, the content that will get him back in your game and not in another game. Has it been already done? Well, chances are, in, at least in part, it's already been done. If it's already been done, go ahead, play, play all the games that are your major, that are going to be your major competitors. Try to, to learn from them, but most of all, try to meet people in those games if they're online, of course. Try to, try to see who those people are. Try to become one of them, to see what really moves them. What are your unique selling points? Well, you should have some innovations in your pocket, right? And are they enough? Will they, will they really allow you to, to get in in the genre that, that you're working on to really make, make some room in the niche to disrupt the genre? If yes, everything is good. If not, get back to the drawing board. And finally, the one, the one question that really requires, a, a, I don't know, a fortune teller, a clairvoyance bow. <laughs> what will the market be when you release? So, Obviously, if, you, if you're working on a five years release schedule, the market, the market could not be there when you release. It could be like, Whoa, oh, Fortnite's here, so no one cares about your game anymore. So try to, especially if you're a small team, don't, don't be too ambitious. Maybe try to, to look in the, in the near future and try to, to get a grasp of, of what's coming and, and how you're gonna fit in there. Otherwise, it might turn out that you, you had an idea for a great product, but by the time you're on the market, that's, that's no longer relevant. Bye, gosh. No harassment, I swear. <laughs> so hi, everyone. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, 
So uh, we're accepting, except for being, you know, quite easily in spending companies' money. We marketing guys are also famous of uh, creating, creating additional work for everyone in the company. So watch out. In the next 15 minutes, I'll try to convince you that, that you need to do your homework and you need to invest more in knowing what is marketing research. First, because I think that there's plenty of good walkthroughs on the internet. And second, and I think that there is no master weapon and you always need to adapt to your circumstances. Uh, that's why I prefer to share some of my personal failures that made me understand this in a hard way. Uh, so I guess that some of the indie developers here, they are probably developing games as a service. Other ones are developing probably games as a product. But for me, developing a game is in a form of art. And you know that for any type of art, there are people who appreciate that art, and probably some of them are willing to pay. So basically, by doing a market research, you uh, sufficiently will be sufficiently better in doing your job at reaching out to these people, meeting their expectations, and satisfying them, and this way improving your retention. And why not even expanding your audience? And all of that will probably sufficiently increase your chances for paying your monthly bills. Uh, by talking too much about the market research, I don't want to make you guys, you know, stop thinking creative and start re and stop risk more because up to me it's the indie developers that are driving the industry because big companies, including the one that I'm working, they're taking very well calculated risks. I just want to say that it's a, a journey for two. You cannot have an idea without making a research. You cannot make a research and, you know, finish without an idea. So uh, in the next five minutes, I'll talk more about three games, games X, Y, and Z. I key, I'll keep these uh, games as a secret because it's a copyright thing. But let's say that they are not game of games. There are some type of game, some kind of games that I, were, I, won, I was on both sides, uh, both production and marketing. Um, so the first game X, it was, uh, we start with an idea and we were, we were inspired by Tempo Run, you know, that guy that was constantly running in the jungle across any kind of bridges and trees. Um, so we decided to create a bit more hardcore game. It was steampunk, uh, that style was steampunk, and you basically, you were uh, controlling your rail plane with your thumb, uh, twisting and turning across bridges and enemies. So we succeeded to attract the attention of electronic arts. We were really close to release the game with them. But one of their last recommendations was to change the, the setup entirely. So basically they suggested, guys, you need to change this post-apocalyptic world with a classroom to replace your uh, evil plane with a paper plane because the market needs something casual at that time. So you can imagine how these recommendations sound to a team of four people that are extremely hardcore players. So we refused to do it. But one year after that, there was a subway surfers, surfers, surfers come, coming to the market. So it was pretty clear they were right. So it is one more example why you should keep really an eye of the art style, the art style that you're considering for your project. Uh, game Y, again, the idea was first to start. Um, it was a quiz game with, um, um, uh, with uh, uh, tower defense elements. Uh, we were really, and uh, we still believe in the cross platform gaming, but unfortunately, we do not put, uh, you know, a priority on it. So basically, at the end of the day, it does not perform well on all of the platforms that we were, were planning to release. Uh, and if we manage to make a better research, we will probably notice that, you know, Trivia Door is running quite well with web. Trivia Crack was doing their extremely good job on the mobile market, and there was a clear need for an app for the smart TVs, when, which niche actually was filled by Trivia Crack two years ago. Uh, the last game, it was the research that initiated the whole project. The idea came as a second. Um, so this game was meant to be the first space MMO based on Unity. Uh, we, we get on a really, really complex trap because we were a studio that was, you know, with a huge uh, uh, desktop and web user base. And first we decided to cross promote, which put a priority on the desktop version of the game. But in reality, our market position was extremely the opposite uh, versus the marketing trend. 
So why there are no successful games of you know MMOs by this time that were you know first starting on browser? It was because everyone who's tried to do it failed a bit. So where's GameLoft in that context? You know we all made mistakes. Um, some of them cost a lot. Some of them not so much. But GameLoft uh, was pretty clear that free to play is the future. But uh, you know, it, it took too much time, you know, to adapt to these circumstances. And I think that all of the dev indie developers, I think that you know it, the flexibility and the risk that you can take is your main advantage and weapon against the biggest, you know, studios on the market. Um, have we learned our lesson from that? I'll talk a, more, a bit more about two topics that are really hot. So basically, we were following the uh, market of IP games. You know, these games that are trying to squeeze off the famous franchise of the market. So we saw that there is no successful LEGO game on the market, and we're about to do that in two months. So let's see if it's going to be successful or not. And the second uh, trivia is a genre where Gameloft is trying, you know, to build a successful game. But after being acquired by Vivendi, it, you know, gave us a really a, a universe of opportunities. And we were definitely looking for a synergy between the other uh, parts of their group. And that's why we decided to acquire Song Pop. You know, it's the best music trivia for almost three years. It's a small studio in New York. So basically, we are trying to utilize the opportunities given by Universal Music and the uh, know how that we can get from Song Pop. So, I hope that I convinced you that you should really Google it and start doing your market research. And I'm really happy to, you know, to listen to your questions, guys. Thank you. Anyone to start? No matter if it's Bulgarian, okay. Ah, I can start if you have no microphone yet. <laughs> Hi, this working? Thank you for the wonderful insights, uh, great lecture, and I have actually two questions for you. Uh, one is uh, for Jeko, and the other is uh, for you. So the first question is obviously Fortnite, a very disruptive product in 2018, crushed it. Absolutely. Uh, do you think that um, how is 2019 going to shape up uh, in this regard? Is there going to be something disruptive, something new, is something on your radar maybe? And the second question is, um, is 2019 a um, good time to start a new game if you're an indie developer? I, I think it's definitely a good time to start a new game because the disruption happened non, not long ago. And right now the, the trend is very strong on the market. So if you start developing now, you'll be able to, to release something fresh uh, by, by the time Fortnite gives some breathing room to everyone else. Also, all the Fortnite copycats are going to, to, to start right now flooding the markets, and they already did start to flood the market. So that takes some of the, some of the pressure. Yes, and just to confirm what I just said, you better do your market research because it depends on the genre that you're going to, you know, to conquer. So it really depends of which of this niche you're going to, you know, get into. So you mentioned Fortnite. It is something that we will try to do next year. So let's see. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh... What would you suggest uh, how, how to start the marketing research in the best uh, way? Uh, something that is your advice, professional. How to start with it? Uh, yes. Some, uh, so are you a gamer, for example? Sorry? Are you a gamer yourself? Uh, I'm a game designer. You're a game designer? Yeah. Okay. So you play games? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so basically play games. Okay. So if you play games and you're not just a spreadsheet guy that is looking at the statistics and now I'm looking of, for example, the releases for last year, I would definitely suggest you to look at those genres that you have that you have an eye. Take a look 
at the market at its current state, try to look in the future because I must say that probably around you know Q4 uh, every year, you know, all of the releases happen. You have to be really aware if you have time to you know to deliver something you know to the market before this period, because otherwise you're not sure that whether the others are not doing it. So, so how, how long uh, ago you you do your researches? How how many time ago you look for the same uh, every similar? quarter? Every quarter. Sorry. Every quarter, every three months. Ah, okay. Every three months, and and unfortunately, you know, I cannot give you a right receipt. I just want to tell you that, for example, if you feel sure that there is no idea like yours in the market. You need to be sure that the platform that you're developing in is the one that's going to be trendy at the end of the at the end of the day. Okay, thank so you. So look look at your favorite niche and look where you're comfortable to start developing. Okay, and this we're going to tell you. And yes. try try to know what really what really moves the people in that niche. Like try to 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 get a hold of those people and see what really motivates them in a game because sometimes. We, we could make grave errors by thinking that that game A is great because people like the achievement, while they don't like the achievement, they're, they're just, for example, grinding for the weapons so they can so they can shoot the deadliest. They just want to rack up frags. Hey guys, so my question might be a little bit too technical, but uh, I'm wondering about uh, 5G networks. Whenever they become a reality, do you, do you expect them to to be a game changer? And how would you prepare for for whatever they enable us to do with games in the future? Mm -hmm. Georgi, I'm sure that you have a better answer than me. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> okay, then, like some, uh, Samsung so stated here's that's... some homework for you. Okay, so <laughs> try, try to think I'll, of I'll what, you, what you can do with a yeah, faster network. I'll give you a what very, kind of a game you yeah, can make? Very concrete example. Mm -hmm. So. As far as I know, 5G is it's, it's life in some part of Korea. Okay, already? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is pretty obvious because, you know, the, the size of the game is a big struggle. So what I monitor for my, you know, most of my campaigns for Game Loft is that there we don't have problems with the, uh, with the, you know, with the price of acquisition, which means that a lot of people don't have problems when they see a big file to download it. Okay. Yeah. So this is one of the advantages that they see. Uh, in terms of you know my work and ensuring that we have enough good conversion rates so we can lower the price of acquisition you know so the lifetime can return this money um, how we are preparing in that sense we are not you know starting to make our games even bigger we are not stopping you are not we are not going to stop optimizing it for this performance but you know in every development it's you know it, at the end of the day there are some things that you need to cut you know, in order to make it even better. So I guess that we are gonna, 5Gs are going to allow us to make, to make, uh, to make less, you know, compromise and to cut less of the content that we are planning to release. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have something to add? No, not really. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, what do you think about the Nintendo Switch as a platform for indie developers, like oh. in 2019 and 2020? Is it going like, to become more viable, or is it going to be focused more on like the, the, the casual and hyper-casual games? No, or can like, people maybe try to do See more serious games on the Switch. I don't believe that it will ever become a hyper casual game game platform, but it it really exploded uh, with with the indie circles because it was a distribution channel that that no one had prepared for. But you can expect that that in 2019 a lot of companies, even big companies, are going to start porting their games for Nintendo Switch. And yeah. it is going to 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 become as a as a distribution platform the same as everything else. So hell, it will be very hard to get discovered over there, to get promoted over there. Sadly, I think this is what's going to happen. On on the other hand, it's it's gonna be a, a lot of work for some for some people, and 
they might get discouraged afterwards if, if they don't if they, if they don't see the necessary results. But definitely, I don't think that it's going to be a hyper casual platform. Maybe some mobile games are going to get ported there, mm -hmm. uh, but but still, it is it is going to be a, a core platform for core gamers. I think. Okay, thank you. And just to add something, so one of our leading titles, we are now porting it to Nintendo Switch in order to understand more about that platform because we don't have any kind of experience. Is that announced? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, one of our leading titles. We have a lot of leading titles. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically, you know, from marketing point of view, you're totally dependent on Nintendo there because the channels, you know, are pretty pretty much there, similar to the console ones and stuff. So it will be a really interesting and curious platform to, to explore. Mm. And with, with the rumors of the Switch Pro getting released, hopefully in the next two years, it, I, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of AAA developers are going to to try to to put it into their build cycles, like PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and Switch, at least for the Switch Pro. Hey guys, it would be a shame not to ask uh, something more about mobile. Um, since phones are getting more and more powerful and uh, internet connections are becoming even more powerful, um, do you see it in your market research um, as a rise in non-casual games developed for mobile? Certainly, but probably not everywhere. Because you, you have to take into account that in Southeast Asia, the phone is the first form of entertainment, the first form of connection with the world that most of the people have. So for them, as they're right now finding out about hardcore gaming, it is viable. But for, for North America, where people usually have a PlayStation 4 Pro and an Xbox or both, and maybe a PC also at home, it's it's really hard to think that they'll throw throw down the uh, the mouse and keyboard, for example, to to start scratching the touchpad. Здравейте. Да. Благодаря за презентацията. Имам два въпроса, които са по-скоро стратегически. Първо, понеже споменахме за market research. В момента за сегашното поколение конзоли най-често игрите са доста, има доста насилие в тях. Кога очаквате да има някаква транзиция по-скоро към игри, които са свързани с най-вече с история и с комуникация между играчите? Това е първи въпрос. И втория въпрос е как според вас ще се отрази блоковата верига над, над финансите в игрите, микротранзакциите и така нататък. Благодаря. Ще се отидам с първия. А, аз много вярвам в навлизането на геймифицирането в университетите и училищата, нали, като въобще начин на обучение. И надявам се и тук да го видим. Аз лично съм имал късмета да уча при Ангел Марчев, който седи ето там, който още от първи курс се опитва да налага това в университета за национално световно стопанство. Та си мисля, че то, аз виждам лично там надеждата да, да повече игри да се появяват в такива с социална отговорност. Се надявам да именно да е движеща сила от това. И повярвам и аз наистина всеки път, като трябва да обяснявам на родителите ми къде работа, това веднага ми идва на главата, нали, каква ми е социалната отговорност. Защото майка ми е лекар и общо взето всеки път ме пита, ти сега пак ще ми създаваш нови пациенти и нали, такива работи. Така че наистина се надявам да се появяват повече и се надявам и ние да сме част от това като стоя. А, за, за втори въпрос. Ами... Да добавя първо само нещо на, за първия въпрос. За съжаление, ако, ако следиш на къде отива киното и другите развлекателни медии, те също не стават по, как да кажа, peaceful и романтични. Напротив, набляга се на насилие навсякъде. Мисля, че, че по-кежел игрите обаче са, са глътка въздух в, в този медиум, защото позволяват а, да се 
как да кажа, да се абстрахираме от това нещо и да се насочим към, към механики, които са много по-подходящи за, за подрастващата аудитория, за, за по-нежната част от, от нас. А иначе за... А иначе за блокчейна в, в игрите не знам. Не знам какво да ти кажа човек. А, тъй като има някои игри, които, които вече това нещо е имплементирано и говореше се за платформи за онлайн дистрибуция, където ще се имплементира това нещо. А, говореше се за какво ли не е факта, обаче още никой не е успял тази технология да я приложи. В смисъл, знае се, че е там, знае се, че е второто най-хубаво нещо след огъня и, и е по-хубаво от топлата вода, обаче никой не е успял да я приложи още. Аз така мисля, така всички. Първо да видим, че работи в банковия сектор. Тогава ще говорим за гения. It should be on now, yes. So I would like to ask about eSports, and uh, since uh, they're on the rise and a lot of people try to make phone eSports a thing, is this something that you consider while making market research? Or making what, sorry? M marketing research. Yeah, w when you're like, researching the, the players um, and what they want, is eSports a factor? So is, the, is the viewership of eSports or or esports products well they go hand in hand so both i guess okay okay um, so let's say that it is something that we are not allowed to speak much but let's say that game of this uh, keeping a very close eye to that industry and, and it is it's here to stay again yeah. and then i can i can share probably my my thoughts on on the current esports if you if you've never watched football and you You watch a football match and you see the guys with the same shirts, they're passing to each other, they're going for the for the door to, to kick the ball in the door, and you're like, okay, I can I can understand what's happening. And all right, show the, the same guy Overwatch. Will he understand what's happening? So in my opinion, it's it's completely not Uh, not happening the same way it's happening in the sports industry and we as an industry should start to think of a way to I've read that somewhere and it was pretty good so not my thought totally and we should as an industry tr try to to make an esport game that is easy to view and interesting for guys that are that are not playing that game non-professionally because otherwise it's It, it's never going to grow outside of the boundaries of the community of the set game. And just to add something, so mm -hmm. from marketing, for marketing point of view, where when we're talking about esports, so there is a very concrete example of several Canadian apps, I can't recall their games, that basically, you know, they're uh, giving away a sports franchise, you know, to everyone who started playing, you know, their marketplace. So. Definitely, there is option for any kind of monetization model for esports games. So, to me. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jacko. From Gamelot Software, you. everybody. Thank you very much for the insight. <laughs> I don't know this, but thanks. <laughs>